Ranger George Best. We're going to start with a little introduction here on what is the War of 1812? What on earth does it have to do with this harvest very place? I thought this was about John Brown and who these guys are. And I'm going to turn it over to them for the actual firing demonstration. And they'll, they'll talk a little bit about what life as a soldier is like and about some of the equipment they're wearing. Uh, you know, they're wearing kind of funny looking hats and coats that probably don't look too uh, familiar. So as I started earlier, well, what on earth does this War of 1812 thing have to do with Harper's Ferry? Usually when you come here, you, know, you think about John Brown, you know, his fort, as we nickname is just down the street. We talk about the Civil War and the battles that were in and around this place and how it had a larger impact on the course of the war. And so when you think 1812, you're more likely to think New Orleans or Fort McHenry, maybe Canada if you've read at least a part of a book some, at some point. The well, Harper's Ferry is very much kind of the behind-the-scenes story of what's going on in a very specific part of the War of 1812. Um, and we're in, we kind of have three big stories that are going to kind of weave together. The first one uh, we have here is the Harper House, what you all are sitting on the porch of. This house was finished in the early 1780s by a man named Robert Harper. He is the founder of the town, the man who gave it its name. He, of course, ran a ferry here, the Harper's Ferry. He also had a grist mill or a mill to make flour and a sawmill. So he established himself as a businessman. He wants his mansion on the hill. He builds this. He dies just before it's finished. And so it's inherited by his niece, Sarah Harper Wager, and her husband, John. And they will live here, um, rent out the lower portion to Basil Williamson, who marries one of their daughters, Margaret. And this is where the Wager family will live for a good while hence. And they uh, will also um, open their home up as a tavern down below and as an inn as well. So this also becomes a kind of a focal point for a lot of people just kind of gather and have some social time. The tavern is where you go to get your local news. Some of them also double as post offices. And so the army, when war is declared against Great Britain, will take advantage of this. They will send recruiting officers all over the place to try to build up a brand new army. Because our army at the very beginning of the War of 1812 is tiny. And we need to build it up so that we can actually take on Great Britain. And so, in Harper's Ferry specifically, very beginning of the war, Philip Wager, one of John Wager's in, um, uh, sons from a second marriage, he will actually become a member of the 12th United States Infantry as an officer. Start recruiting here before he's ordered off elsewhere. For a longer period, we know from newspaper accounts, Lieutenant Angus McDonald will come here and try to encourage young men to do their patriotic duty, also take a hefty chunk of change and some land out west as a, a little incentive to join up, and go and fight the British, mostly up in Canada. And so they will use taverns like this building to try to do that, to raise young men. We also have a story of kind of a different style of army here, the militia. Think National Guard but far less organized. Uh, pretty much any, it very slightly state to state, pretty much any male between the ages of 18 and 45 is going to be a member of the militia and is subject to be called out for military duty, especially in times of emergency. In 1814, there is such an emergency. The British have landed in a little town called Benedict, Maryland, and are marching on Washington, D.C. to try to capture our capital. And so some men in Charlestown band together to try to form a company to help go and help. And they come here to Harper's Ferry for weapons. There, and this is where another of the stories come in, we have the armory and arsenal down on the river. And they are making weapons, as these men are carrying here, to fight this war. And they are just turning them out, thousands upon thousands. They will average 10,000 every year. And it is these weapons these men are coming here to try to get. And they actually get the very last weapons. Sixty of the armory workers are formed up under the superintendent of the armory here in Harper's Ferry to join the men from Charlestown to form a Jefferson County company and will then march off to war. They don't make it in time to help defend the capital. It's probably just as well. We lose the Battle of Bladensburg very, very badly. And Washington, D.C. is burned including the White House. And if you know where to look very carefully, you can still see a few scorch marks coming through the paint. <coughs> but they do participate in another smaller battle uh, in what is now today part of Fort Belvoir in Virginia in the Potomac River. You are welcome to come onto the porch. Go ahead and walk in front of me. Yeah, we got, a, we got cars coming. We... 
and you're also more than welcome to walk upstairs. We do ask that you stay on this two-thirds of the porch here so you're not in front of the muzzles. So they do to partake in this smaller battle in Virginia. So we've got these two stories going on. We have the industry of the guns being made to supply the soldiers. We are also supplying soldiers themselves for this war effort, both regulars and militia. But there's also kind of a hidden war specific to Virginia and also Maryland. The British have come into the Chesapeake Bay with a fleet to wage war a little closer to the heartland as opposed to where most of the fighting is going on up in Canada. And they have been ordered, don't start a slave rebellion. Virginia and Maryland both have large populations of slaves. Virginia actually has the largest in the country. But they, although they've been told don't start a slave rebellion, they have been given the leeway to play on American fears of a slave rebellion. There is a belief among Americans at this time that will change a little later in history, but that their African slaves are barbaric savages that need to be subjugated. The two races cannot coexist together without one subjugating the other. And of course, the white Americans have managed to subjugate the Africans. And therefore, they need to maintain their position in charge. But they also believe that their slaves are seeing all of these freedoms they've gained from the revolution and are now enjoying in their independence. And they want it. They covet it. And so, the slave owners of Virginia and Maryland live in constant fear of slave rebellions. The British play on this fear. They encourage slaves to run away and join them. At first, they just want guides to get up all the rivers that are coming out of the, uh, the Chesapeake Bay. But then, so many are coming to them, they all start offering them the opportunity to join the British military. And they get just enough, they're actually able to form specialized units composed almost entirely of former slaves from Virginia and Maryland, called the Colonial Marine Corps. And these men will be turned loose on their former owners in Virginia and Maryland and to help fight. They're noted as being ferocious fighters. There is no threat of them ever deserting to the other side because the other side is going to either kill them or put them back as being property. And so now they have a chance for revenge. And the people of Virginia and Maryland are now terrified that these guys in British uniforms with British muskets are now going to serve as an example to those who either have not had the opportunity to run away or have not yet to possibly take matters into their own hands and start another rebellion. And we know from letters coming out of Harper's Ferry that this fear is very real. Also probably exacerbated by the fact that the arsenal, after the men leave to go help defend D.C., is completely empty. All that's left is dust and spare parts. They have issued every single gun, including, for example, some old ones that were captured from Hessian troops at the Battle of Trenton in 1776. Some of these guns are 40 years old. They've given out everything. And <clears throat> so you have all of these stories kind of weaving together here in Harper's Ferry. Um, so you have, again, the soldiers trying to go off and fight the war, the armory arming these soldiers so they are able to fight. And then also the lingering fears of the families that have stayed here in Harper's Ferry and other towns like this. And now the British have attacked Washington, D.C. and burned it. And so now the British are able to keep, there's this fear that maybe the British will even come this far in with it. It's not actually logistically possible for them to do that, but that fear is there. And so it's a very complicated time for a lot of these people. And so, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Scratching my throat. <coughs> I'm not dying, I promise. Mm. All right. <coughs> okay, let's try that again. So, you, again, you have these three stories interweaving together that kind of form the story of the War of 1812 in Harper's Ferry and what you're kind of going to see happen throughout a lot of the areas in this region. But a lot of the men being raised here, they're not actually standing here. They're fighting the Battle of War in Canada. And to tell that story and how these battles are going to be fought and a little bit about their equipment, I'm going to turn you over to the 12th United States Infantry, the unit that was actually recruiting out of Harper's Ferry and was largely composed of men from the Shenandoah Valley and, and large parts of Virginia. And so I now give you Sergeant James Owens of the 12th U.S. Infantry. Yeah. 
Lock, Must, these remain here at Harper's Ferry in Springfield, Massachusetts. Flint Lock is the dominant technology of the time it was added in the late 17th century until almost the middle of the 19th century. We have a flint stone known as the jaws of this hammer. We have a steel striker known as a frisbee. We pull that trigger and create a shower of sparks. Falls into this little pan here that's filled with gunpowder and ignites it. And that flash carries through a hole in the barrel, igniting the main charge. These are smooth bore muskets. The inside of the barrel is perfectly smooth, just like a water pipe in the house. They fire an undersized round ball with three pieces of buckshot. It's a bucket ball. And the, and the, the idea for this is to allow for rapid loading. Every time you fire, black powder that's mainly charcoal, and it leaves a huge pile of soot after every shot. So you have to, if you're going to load it fast, you have to have an undersized ball. And to compensate for the poor marksmanship that comes with an undersized ball, you mash your men shoulder to shoulder and have them, have them fire on command. What I'm going to do is put these men through the manual exercise firing sequence. They would learn that in training. They would, each movement would be done on command. When they went into action, they would be simply given the word prime and load, and they would go through all those motions on their own. Attention. Shoulder, arm. Open your hand. Handle cartridge. What they're going to do is pull out a cartridge, which is a paper tube holding a pre-measured charge, gunpowder, ground ball, and three bucks shot. Prime. Shut. Hand. Once they've primed their pan, they have to put the rest of the charge in the projectile down the barrel. Charge. Cartridge. Muslims, you have to use a ramrod to force that charge in your projectiles down to the bottom. Failure to do that could destroy the barrel and injure yourself. Ram, cartridge.